Hi everyone, welcome back to the Blender video casts for motion graphic artists. In this episode we're going to talk about text, which doesn't seem like such a big deal, text tool, and it's really not. It's pretty simple. I don't I'm not gonna go into um all the different ways that you could style text and stuff like that in Blender. There are posts online about that, and once you reach the point where you need to apply styles to text, you will find lots of different ways. I'm going to go more over the basics of the text tool and then how to start using that for the titling sequences that pretty much anyone saying that that they do motion graphics uh, are pretty much expected to do. So we'll do a, a really simple, a fairly simple title sequence. I can't promise it's going to look completely beautiful. I think you'll get the idea pretty quickly. So first of all, I wanted to talk a little bit, since we're actually going to do something that, uh, that that kind of makes some logical sense. It's not just cubes and spheres this time. For For motion graphic creation, I find that it's really good to be in a certain view in your main 3D view. And, and the view has a name, and it's got a keyboard shortcut, and the keyboard shortcut is the 7 on the number pad. Uh, let's get this cube out of our way. So we get a centered top-down view of, our, of, of the default grid that, that Blender provides. I'm going to go ahead and get rid of, actually, the camera, and I'm going to get rid of that light. And you'll see why I did that in a moment. So this is a top-down view of exactly the space that we have to work with in in the well we have limitless space but this is the the correct orientation that we have to work with so when we think of the y-axis we think usually of a vertical axis and that's the green line when we think of x we usually think of a cross a horizontal line that's the red one and the blue axis that we can't really see because it's pointing directly out at us it would be the Z axis. So that's what we're presented with in this mode. And and I think that it's a lot easier in that sense to work in that top-down view rather than trying to kind of, you know, you're rotating yourself around and now which way is up, which way is down, you, you, almost, you almost can't tell. I mean, it gets really confusing. Or it can get very confusing. So we're going to go back to the top-down view and that's a good view to start with for, for most of the basic, or rather, most of the motion graphic sequences that I find myself doing anyway for, for any video project. That's the view that I start with. Generally what I do is I place my 3D cursor right dead center, and I hit the Shift A key to add something, and I add a camera first. This provides a camera that is pointing exactly at the grid. So once again, I kind of I'm setting up an animation table. If you're if you're if you've done any traditional animation, this is all very familiar to you. There's a grid. The center point is zero. Everything to the right is positive. Everything to the left is negative. Up is positive. Down is negative. And the camera is pointing straight down. So we don't get any funky angles. We don't have to figure out where exactly our camera is and what's exactly straight. We don't really care because we know that we've placed the camera at the center point and we know that it's pointing completely down. Now, if if you're not sure about that or if you want to confirm that, and we're going to use this trick a couple of times probably in this particular episode and probably uh, from now on, uh, there's the transform palette or the transform panel. Uh, you access this panel by hitting the N key. That's... Uh, the N key gives you a slide out transform panel, a couple of different view, a couple of different options, including, like I say, transform. And that tells you a lot of data on an object that you might have selected. So right now we've got the camera selected, and it tells me that the rotation is zero, 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 uh, the scale is one, and the location is actually a little bit off center because I eyeballed the uh, 3D cursor. But as you can see, we can pretty much set this exactly at zero, zero. So if we go up here to where our camera view normally is and set that as a camera view, it went away because we um, 
we we got rid of the camera. But you can you can pretty much see with your eye, I think, that the exact center of the camera frame is the intersection of the X and the Y axis. And that's kind of what you'd expect um, with a, a setup like this, because that way you know where everything is in relationship to everything else. It's very, very helpful to set yourself up this way. In fact, it's so helpful that what I generally do is create my own layout with a couple of tweaks and this really, again, as I've said in previous episodes, this is a lot smaller of a screen that I'm normally using because I'm, I, I want to capture something that can be easily compressed into something reasonably downloadable. But if you create a, a, an outline or a, a rather a view for yourself that you really, really like, a default kind of setup, you can not only make your own layout by hitting the plus sign and that adds something, so I'll, I'll just call this motion. So now in our, in our, in our view, we've, in our menu rather, we've got animation, we've got default, and we've got our new one, motion. So that's got all that data. And then you can of course go to user preferences and say, save that setup as a default setup. So every time you open Blender from that point on, it will open up to this layout for you. So recall that uh, seven in the number pad, it gets you to this top town view. Zero gets you the camera view. And then five gets a user view, which, you know, if you, if you just got back from seven, it's not going to actually be any different. But five is the one that you can kind of maneuver around and see where everything is. But in this particular episode, we'll be using a, a quite a bit of the of these numbers here because frankly it's just it makes things really easy especially when you're in this top-down view you know exactly how far your camera is away from your grid you know where every object on the grid is in relation to the camera in the z space z axis space and and you you can kind of maneuver it just just using the numbers and some simple math or logic so that's our setup. That's the way that I typically kind of like to start out because I just think that it's um, a good way to start a project. So now we will add some text. So um, to add text, it's Shift A. Go down to text, go up to text, click on that. And now you're going to notice, I think, that the text is facing us. I don't know if you remember in a previous episode, we had added text, and it was kind of like that. You could barely see it. You could you, you had to kind of maneuver around just to kind of see the text. It wasn't terribly graceful. That's another reason why I like this top-down view because it's it apparently the Blender people kind of imagined that if you're doing text, you are in this top-down view. So it's a very good reason to work in this top-down view, and uh, we'll just bring it into the line of sight for the camera. And there we go, we've got some text. Um, so text in Blender can be edited, and in fact, really any object can be edited, uh, in the edit mode. And there are two modes in Blender. I, I kind of hinted at this last time, I think it was, in the lighting tutorial where I was modifying that cube, if you'll recall. This is going to be a little bit less spectacular, but it's the same idea. So right now we're in the object mode, meaning that we can grab onto objects and move them around and rotate them and all the things that we've done um, already. So to edit text or any object, you, you need to be in edit mode, which happens to be very easy to reach tab key. Hit tab, it puts you into edit mode. This might mean that you can edit some portion of a cube or a sphere or whatever, or if you're in text, it simply t br brings you into a text prompt, a normal kind of functional text prompt, and you can write anything here that you want. I'm gonna put my Linux distribution that I use. Uh, notice when I hit return, I didn't get, I didn't get out of the text prompt. It just brought me to the next line. So tab gets you back out of, out of the text prompt. Kind of center it there on the camera. So some of the basic things you can do with your text are found, of course, in the properties panel over on the right, in the, predictably enough, the um, object data tab, which looks like a little letter F. 
Um, so that's kind of where you go to modify any property of any object, including like a lamp. We, we saw that yesterday or the, the previous episode. Um, and a cube, you could edit stuff there. So this is kind of just the place that you go to your first stop to, to kind of modify things. And sure enough, that's where we uh, find our text. I'm going to give it a label, which doesn't really appear anywhere usually, except right there in the, um, not the dope sheet, but whatever this thing is called. Um, what is this called? Outliner. Outliner. Um, so that's um, supposed to be the outliner. So that's uh, one thing that you can do to kind of keep things in order for yourself, because the more elements you start adding, the more confusing it gets. We don't have anything in the dope sheet yet, but you'll see that eventually, you know, a, a bunch of occurrences of text objects and and lamps start to not be very descriptive. So giving yourself labels to work with sometimes really helps. Won't worry about too much of that stuff, but the font, of course, is something that you're probably typically, you're, you're probably very frequently going to want to change. Turns out that um, Blender ships with like one font and it's called B font, I think. Yep, B font. Not very exciting. That's it right there. Um, instead, we'll go out to our file browser. And you've seen this in the opening and saving episode. So here's our opening and saving dialog box. And in this case, we're going to open a font. Now I have my collection of font fonts in my multimedia sprint folder, which uh, is a free download from slackermedia.info. It's got about 2,455 free licensed fonts um, and lots of other stuff. Blender plugins, um, vectors, brush sets for GIMP, uh, all kinds of cool things. So it's free. It's about a gig, a two gig download. It's, it's not small, but it, it is good. So I'm just going to have to pick out a font here at random, more or less. I'm trying to remember more or less what might be appropriate. Let's just do a basic sans serif. Uh, let's just grab this. Not bad, not bad. So there's a font. You get the idea. You can just point it at your font folder. You can also set that in your user preferences. Uh, it doesn't doesn't always have to go out to the file browser. You can you can kind of it'll start adding the the fonts that you use to that menu to the pop up menu there. But um, let's get this down to size a little bit. And I think you'll find in this top down view that that maneuvering really is a lot easier. It makes a lot more sense. Up is always up and down is always Y left and right is always X, closer to the camera is always Z, or farther from the camera is always Z. So it's it's kind of nice. You, you start to get used to it pretty quickly, and, and you'll find, especially for these kinds of things where you're just doing basically two-dimensional objects in a 3D space, which is what a lot of motion graphics boils down to being a lot of times, because after all, it's going to end up on a flat screen, and it's a lot of times just for slates and title sequences, things like that. So for those uses, this is a really kind of nicely oriented view. We're going to do the old trick of getting a different background for ourselves. And uh, if you don't recall, that would have been in the properties panel in the world view, in the world tab. And the drop down menu that you're going to want to use initially is the world menu and you give it a real sky or you can play around with other things as well I I'm, I tend to just go for real sky lately uh, give the hor the horizon color a uh, complete black and then find the stars I love the stars and throw some stars in the background because um, that just makes it a lot more interesting I think so if we render this, what are we going to see? Think now. So 